Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Then it goes on to say in verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's from the King James Version. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Turn and tell the person on either side of you, when I bless my neighbor, when I, bless my neighbor I, bless my I bless my Savior. Tell someone else, when I bless my neighbor, when I, bless my neighbor I, bless my I bless my Savior. Give him another hand clap of praise. When I bless my neighbor, I bless my Savior. Brothers and sisters, one of the greatest gifts given to us by God is family. And one of the greatest emotions known to mankind is love. As I've shared with you before, in the Greek language, the original language of the New Testament, there are four primary words for love. The first Greek word for love is phileo, which describes the love between brothers and sisters. From this word, we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The second Greek word is storge, which represents love for family. Many individuals have called their fathers and, and wished them a happy Father's Day because it denotes a love for uh, this member of the family, this primary member of the family. The third word, word is eros, which refers to physical attraction. Uh, this is where we get our word erotic. It represents sexual love. The fourth word is agape, which is sacrificial love. This love is more closely related to the love of God and the love of a father. Agape love is reflected in John 3, 16. For the Lord God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Agape love reflects a willingness to give, listen to me carefully, our unconditional love with the hope that whoever we love will love us back. We love unconditionally, not with any guarantee that we're going to be loved back. We love unconditionally with the hope that the person or the people that we love will love us back. Now, with this being Father's Day, allow me to share one more thing. Agape love should always precede heiress love or erotic love or sexual love. Understand, to be sexual, are you listening to me? And most people that I know are sexual. We've got a few uh, eunuchs, we've got a few individuals that have dedicated themselves to the love of God and the service of God, but I don't know a whole lot of them, so this is for everybody else. <laughs> sexual love, this heiress love, this erotic love uh, should be... Uh, we should have agape love come before this sexual love because sexual love is ordained by God. For those individuals that think they're just sexual, let me tell you, it didn't just happen like that. God put that inside of us that are men and those of us that are women. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? Now look at, in the, listen to the words of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28a. Genesis 1. Verses 27 to 28a. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now watch verse 28a. And God blessed them. And God said, listen to this, be fruitful and multiply or have sex and have children and replenish the earth and subdue it. So you think you're just having children, just having babies. You're not just having babies and children. It is ordained by God that it would be so. So when it comes to our sexuality, it is clear it is part of God's plan. But remember, marriage is also part of God's plan. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, listen to what Adam says. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. He says a man is going to leave his father and mother, not, his, not that he's going to disown them, but he is going to take up ownership of his own family, and he's going to cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Paul shared this truth. Now concerning things where have you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. I want to just dwell on that just for a moment because in the church, most of the time we greet people. Am I right? Men greet women, women greet men. But I want to say this here. There is a way that you greet a woman that's not your woman. All right. You don't go hugging all on them, squeezing them. You understand what I mean? You don't go, you don't go kissing all of them. Back in the day, you said busting slobs. You don't, do, you don't do no stuff like that. Amen. Paul says it's better if you don't even touch them. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. And then there are ways you can hug. You know, give them the, the side shoulder. All right, let's move on. But the Bible goes on to say in verse number two, 1 Corinthians 7 2, nevertheless, to avoid fornication or sex outside of marriage, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. Are you all praying with me? Okay, watch this. And I might add, you have your own husband, your own wife, for better, for worse, for rich and for poor, in sickness and in health, until God by death shall separate you. And in this experience we call life, all of the aforementioned situations will come to pass before God says, well done. That's why we need a covenant relationship with God and with each other. Turn to somebody and say, I got to change my thinking. <laughs> now, let me tell you why. For those who think that having sex outside of marriage is a new thing, please keep in mind, God's been dealing with this specific issue for a long time. Amen. It's no new thing. Listen to this. This is 2017. But the words of Paul, those words were written in AD 57, where he says every man should have his own wife and every woman her own husband. That was almost 2,000 years ago. And the marriage plan of God that he shared with Adam was about 4,000 BC or more than 6,000 years ago. I think Solomon put it best in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, when he said, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Nothing's new. I'm going to tell you this here. For those of you that have a little age on you, the clothes that you had like 20 years ago, if you didn't throw them away, I'm telling you, you're going to be wearing them next year. There's nothing new under the sun. I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get gross with this, but I want you to understand there's no new water. Whatever water you bathed in today, at some point, someone urinated it some days ago. And God sent the sun and caused it to evaporate and go into the heavens, into the clouds. And then he caused the storm to come about. And the same water that evaporated went to the clouds now comes back to the earth. And that's what we're drinking. Are you all praying? Somebody say, same water, nothing new. Nothing new. Okay, I'm going to try not to be gross. I'm going on. And so agape love, okay, agape love for God and mankind should naturally be the focus of our love. But that's not always the case. Now, even though most of us don't go to the extreme, we still have a tendency to hurt those that are the closest to us and most likely will help us, namely the members of our family. A lot of people don't want, to, don't want to get married because they've seen too much hurt in other families. But turn to someone and say, that's not our testimony. I want to give you a few points on what you can do to improve your relationship with your family. Number one, pray for each other. Brothers and sisters, this might come as a shock to some of you, but we all have issues. The conflict is not always without Sometimes it's within. You all all look real good, but I'm telling you right now, I don't know you the way I, I can know you, and you don't know me the way you can know me. We got some issues. I'm just gonna look around this, this congregation. You smile and you saved and you're on your way to heaven, but you got some issues. All right, now watch this. Once we realize that we too have sinned and come short of God's expectations, it's easier for us to confess our faults one to another and to pray one for another. James chapter 3 verse 16 uh, tells us that for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Let me talk to you about prayer. Prayer 
releases the power of God that releases us from anger, bitterness, strife, envy, and the attitudes that lead to family feuds. You see, it's hard to hate someone or even be cruel or mean to someone when you're praying for that someone. Again, James tells us, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Listen to what he says, that you may be healed. James 5, 16, he says when you pray for someone and, and confess your faults to someone, watch this, you get healed. The effectual, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer not only releases the power of God into the life of the person you're praying for, it also releases the power of God into your life and brings you into a right relationship with God. Have you ever noticed how difficult it is to pray consistently? How difficult it is to have a prayer room and consistently, daily, go in and talk to God about your concerns or about his goodness. Have you ever noticed how difficult it is? We can get folks to come to a worship service, but when it's time for a prayer service, they're almost absent without leave. Am I talking to anybody here? Because it is very difficult to pray. Prayer allows me not only to see what folks have done to me, but it allows me to see what folks have done to them, and more more importantly, it allows me to see how God has lifted me. Amen. Amen. So we got to pray one for another. Number two, we have to accept each other. We have to accept each other. Turn to your neighbor, look at him real quick. Accept them. Accept them. There are two vital bits of information to keep in mind. Number one, no one is perfect, perfect, including you. I know you think you are, but you're not. And number two, the person you're judging could also be judging you. In Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 1, the Bible says, judge that you be not judged. Rob Hempio shares a poem about a man who goes to heaven, and in it he shares the man's reaction. How many of you going to heaven? Okay, everybody's going to heaven. All right. <laughs> I was about to say, man, we got to get this thing together now, right? Praise the Lord. Amen. But watch this. The man goes to heaven, and this is his reaction. I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered in the heaven's door, he said. Not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or the decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. There stood the kid from the seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Her, who I always thought was rotting in hell, was sitting on a cloud, cloud nine that is, looking pretty well. I nudged Jesus, hey Jesus, what's the deal? I, I would love to hear your take. How do all these sinners get here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush, my son, he said. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd be seeing you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you all came to church today. But I always have to remind myself, going to church doesn't make me a Christian any more than standing in my garage makes me a call. All right. Look at your neighbor again. Very quickly, don't look long. What do you see? Don't answer that question. What you see is difference. You see difference. Now get this. We're not just different on the outside. We're also different on the inside. And don't tell anybody I told you, but God made you that way. Amen. The psalmist says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We come in different sizes, am I right about it, and, and shapes and colors. We come with different ways and different passions, different likes and dislikes. Uh, and though we are all unique, we yet all come from the same bloodline. The Bible tells us in Acts 17 verse 26, and he hath made of all one blood, 
all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. I've got a news flash for you. Your wife is not your mother. Your husband is not your father. Your children are not the answers to your unanswered dreams. The people in the city or on this campus or in this church are not like the people in the city where you came from or the campus where you used to go or the church that you used to praise them in. So stop trying to make folks, including your family members, fit into your world. As long as our family members are not walking in unrighteousness, we need to pray for each other and we need to accept each other. Amen? Amen. Everybody doesn't keep a clean house. Come on, everybody doesn't put the dishes in the dishwasher. Everybody doesn't make the bed when they get up. Everybody doesn't drive in a, in a car that hasn't been cleaned for three weeks. Even if they are not where we think they ought to be, remember we can't judge them because in some way we're all messed up. We're all messed up. A young couple moved into a new neighborhood. The next morning, while they were eating breakfast, the wife, uh, she sees her neighbor hanging her clothes on the line outside. She looked at it, and she says, that laundry isn't very clean. She must not know how to wash, or she may be using the wrong laundry soap. Her husband looked on, but he didn't say a word. Every time the neighbor would hang the clothes on the line to dry, the young woman would make the same comments. About a month later, the woman was surprised to look out of her window and see the clothes on the line, and they were so nice, and they were so clean. And she said to her husband, she says, honey, honey, come look. The clothes are nice and clean. I wonder who taught her how to wash. The husband looked at her, and he said, I did. I got up this morning and washed our windows. <laughs> And so it is with family. What we see when watching others depends on the purity of the windows or the eyes that we are looking through. And so when we pray, we have to pray for each other and accept each other, even if we don't think they measure up. Number three, say good things about each other. Don't ever say something negative about someone else so that make, because it makes you feel better. Paul says in, e in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use in edifying that it may minister grace to the hearer. They may not deserve it, but I'm, I'm here because God put me in your life to make you feel better about who you are. A woman walked into a bathroom at home and she saw her husband sucking in his stomach. We know that, don't we? Some of our men can relate to that. He was sucking in his stomach as he weighed himself on the bathroom scale. The woman thought to herself, silly man, does he really think he'll weigh less by sucking in his stomach? So the woman sarcastically said to her husband, listen dear, sucking in your stomach is not going to really help you. Her husband looked at her semi-surprised. Then he said this, sure it will. It's the only way I can see the numbers. <laughs> All right, suck it in, praise the Lord. You're supposed to hold your stomach in all your life. All right, let me say this. The woman knew her husband was struggling with his size. This is real talk now. But instead of making matters better, her words were designed to make matters worse. And we must be careful that the same isn't true for you and me. Keep in mind, your words will build up or tear down. Your words will speak peace or destruction. Your words will edify or terrify. So to improve your relationship with your family, you've got to pray for each other, accept each other, speak good words to each other. And finally, brothers and sisters, you have to invest in each other. The Bible says, give it, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Why do you expect to get something from those you're not giving to? And even if you give to them, don't necessarily expect them to bless you. God's going to make sure that somebody gives you what you need to succeed. When it comes to family, we must invest our time, our energy, our resources, our love, our prayers, and our undivided attention. I don't care where you go. Be where you're supposed to be. Don't be at work thinking about home, but don't be home thinking about work. When it comes to family, to borrow a slogan from American Express card, membership has... It's privileges. The story is told of a boy who was stood on the sidewalk waiting for a bus. 
A man walking by saw the boy standing there. And so he said to him, he says, listen, son, he says, you're in the wrong spot. If you want to catch the bus, you got to go to the corner. That's where the bus stops for the passengers. It's okay, the boy said, I'll, I'll just wait right here. The man went to the corner, and, and as he was going, he repeated the message, but the boy never moved. Just then, the bus appeared. Amazingly, it pulled over to where the boy stood, and the child hopped on. The man on the sidewalk, which was already at the corner, he was speechless. The little boy turned in the doorway of the bus and said, it's okay, mister. I knew the bus would stop here because the bus driver is my daddy. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, when you're in the family of God, naturally or spiritually, it changes the rules. Now let me share one more story with you. It's about a woman by the name of Marion Shield Robinson. I love this story. She was a homemaker and later a secretary at Spiegel Cadillac's catalog store. She, along with her husband, Frazier Robinson III, a water plant employee, loved their children and worked hard to ensure that her children had access to opportunities that were never available to them. Both children went to Princeton University and their daughter also graduated from Harvard University. Are y'all listening? From a water plant worker and a secretary, this is their destiny. The daughter ultimately met and married a stately young man by the name of Barack Obama, the 44th president of these United States of America. Now watch this. When Michelle Obama moved into the White House, her mother, Marion Shield Robinson, also moved into the White House. You know why? Because Michelle Obama and Barack Obama had learned years ago as kids, it's a family affair. And so it is, brothers and sisters, with you and with me. Whether it is your house, my house, the White House, or the church house, let your folks know I care. And no matter what, I will be there. And then let them know why. When I bless my neighbor, I bless my Savior. Give my Savior a hand clap of praise and celebration. In Jesus' name. Happy Father's Day to all our fathers. Come on, celebrate Jesus in this house.